that the number one pick in the 2021 NBA draft goes to the Detroit Pistons. Who's got the number one pick in this year's draft? Who's got the number one pick in this year's draft? Basketball! Select Isaiah Stewart. The Detroit Pistons select Killian Hayes. Sadiq, that was absolutely sensational. I don't know what went into that process. I met the criteria to be selected, but I wasn't. From long range. Oh! Yes! 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 Detroit Basketball! Pistons fans, welcome back to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mike Angolano, and joining me, as always, is Aaron Johnson. Aaron, it's just a two-man show like the good old days. Yeah, it's it's like the good old days. No Jasper around to, to ruin it for us. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Jasper, a no-show this week. It's unfortunate he had to cancel on us. Uh, but we're going to hold down the fort. We're just a few weeks away from the NBA draft. The Pistons have the fifth pick, so we've got uh, a, a, a topic to talk about in regards to the draft. We've got some other stuff to talk about as well, just kind of in general and what's setting up to be what could be a, a pretty big offseason for the Pistons. So, Mike, it's like the... Old days, it's just you and I, the, the core two, I guess, is what we'll call it. And uh, yep. back, just us two this week, excited to get into it. And uh, we'll have Jasper back next week, hopefully. Yes, back to the uh, retro days uh, when I was recording and editing this podcast on my apartment floor uh, at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, things have changed a little bit, but what hasn't changed is us being able to get together and talk about the Pistons. And we will do just that. We will get to some draft talk. We will get to uh, some off season talk as well. The draft is fast approaching. Um, so going to try to get primed up and, and uh, take in all the Intel that the media outlets are, are providing. And one of those, um, is sort of through smoke screens. We have to try to decipher all this information that's being hurdled at us at mock speed to uh, you know determine if if any of this information is even usable. Um, so we'll get to some of that. We'll get to some other things regarding the off season. Uh, first, a word from our sponsor, and that of course is Bet Online. And our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports development including this year's basketball championship finals. The NBA finals are here. We haven't talked about it uh, yet, um, but maybe we'll try to sneak some finals talk in there, as well as the NHL Hockey Conference finals, Major League Baseball's back, and the latest fighting news, even next season's early NFL future. So head on over to the website or use your mobile device today. Sign up, receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit using our promo code BLEAVE, that's B L. EAV to get the bonus and get into the action again. Sign up today, receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit using our promo code BLEAV, B L E A V. So get on over, get your promo code ready, put it in on your first deposit, 50% welcome bonus. That's awesome. Bet online where the game starts. So we'll get on moving to our first topic today, and that is um, the Pistons being primed to make a splash this summer. We've talked a lot in our group chat um, over at Pallets of Pistons talking about things the Pistons could do. And, you know, we were talking before the podcast about how when we did our live stream of the NBA draft last year, um, how there actually wasn't a whole lot of interest when we did that live stream. And I think partially because they had the number one pick and everyone knew for, I mean, as soon as the ping pong ball dropped with the Pistons logo, they knew who the Pistons were going to pick. There was this weird belief that they were going to trade out of number one, which was never going to happen. Um, this year is different. There's a lot of different moves that the, um, the Pistons can make at five. They're sort of in that weird gray area where if they, traded up it wouldn't be too surprising if they traded back it wouldn't be too surprising if they traded and got another lottery pick it wouldn't be all that surprising so they do have you know some wiggle room and with jeremy grant being one of the most talked about trade targets of the offseason in a pretty weak free agency pool relatively speaking 
no offense to Zach Levine. Um, he's a, you know, Grant is a gettable player and the Pistons are asking for a lot and they should be. Um, so the Pistons are, you know, could potentially be moving him. They have plenty of cap space. They have a top five pick in the draft. They've been linked to DeAndre Ayton. They've been linked to Jalen Brunson. They've been linked to Colin Sexton. And as more teams start to um, shape how they want to handle their offseason, we just saw the Utah Jazz, uh, you know, who are sitting on the precipice of blowing up, you know, could move Rudy Gobert and or Donovan Mitchell. Um, Zach Levine in Chicago seems like he's, you know, at least going to see what other teams have to offer. Uh, Brian Windhurst of ESPN doesn't seem like super confident that he's going to leave the Bulls, but still is a possibility. And there's definitely a need for the Pistons to put somebody next to Kate Cunningham. So the Pistons are primed they, to make a big splash. They could, they have the pieces, they have the cap space, the players, the picks to, you know, to make a big splash. Um, do you really feel like they need to make a big splash? Cause I, I don't really think so, but I think they should be creatures of opportunity. And if, you know, if something presents itself, uh, they should be ready to pounce. Yeah. So I think when you look at the off season for the Pistons this summer, I think you did a really good job kind of highlighting the situation that they're in and, and the opportunity that could conceivably be uh, around for them, available for them to make a big move. Um, you look at the assets that they have, Jeremy Grant, obviously one of the most sought after names. They have the fifth pick uh, in this year's draft. They have the cap space to absorb a, a big contract. And there are other factors outside of their own roster that they're connected to. And we could conceivably see them being connected to in the guys you mentioned, Aiton, Sexton, Brunson. Are there other guys that they could chase? Does a Donovan Mitchell, does a Zach Levine, do either of those guys make sense for the Pistons? And there should be, the front office should feel pressure to make a significant move this summer. This is a team now that, back-to-back, bottom-tier team in the Eastern Conference, bottom-tier team uh, in the NBA. Yes, they have a, a, a young core that's exciting. Obviously, it's fortified by Kate Cunningham, and it has some other nice pieces in Sadiq Bay and Isaiah Stewart. Um, but it still is a team that is lacking a severe amount of talent. This is a team that needs talent very, very much, and – that's why Detroit should be working every avenue to go out and try to add as much talent as they can this offseason. And a guy like Donovan Mitchell, you know, if you if you look into the Utah situation, just for example, Quinn Snyder leaving the team, Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN reporting that Mitchell was shocked and disappointed by it. There's already been reports uh, about him being unhappy and maybe looking to move out of Utah. Like the Pistons should definitely be one of those teams calling and saying, putting together their best, best package and, and say, look, we have Jeremy Grant. We have the fifth pick. We have Isaiah Stewart. We have Killian Hayes. We have Sadiq Bay. We have future picks. Let's figure out something where both of us can come away with, if you're Utah, pieces to either A, try to stay somewhat competitive, but also have some assets to, to build with uh, down the line. And then the Pistons can go get a player that's going to help take them to the next level alongside Kate Cunningham. And that's something that Detroit, Detroit should be doing really with any name that comes out as a potential uh, piece that can be acquired via the trade market. Zach Levine, another guy that in Chicago, like if he doesn't resign, if he doesn't take an extension in Chicago, if I'm Detroit, I'm definitely pulling up the phone and seeing what it would take uh, to get Zach Levine in. And, and Detroit has to be open to anything. No one on this roster is really untouchable outside of Kate Cunningham. Sadiq Bey obviously is a very promising young player, but if you can get an established all-star level player like a Levine, um, you know, like a Donovan Mitchell, or if there's someone else that, that comes down to the table and, and presents itself as an option, like the Pistons have to be willing to move anything and everything outside of Kate Cunningham uh, to get a player of that stature. So the Pistons cannot afford to have another season uh, next year, like they have had these past few years where they're, you know, a sub-25 win team, bottom of the conference, top lottery odds. This is a team that we need to see take a jump. And when you look at the assets that they have this offseason, as well as the money, this is a team that is primed to make a move. I do think, you know, when you when you talk about all oh, they have a ton of cap space, like it's just expected that they're going to spend that in free agency. But 
what we know with Detroit is they're not the hottest free agency destination. They don't go out and get Max guys to a free agency. So that puts a little bit more pressure on the front office to really work the phones via trade and, and seek out some of these players that are may, maybe unhappy in their current situation. And that that should allow Detroit to to be a factor like they like Stan Van Gundy did uh, with Blake Griffin. Now, you know, obviously that wasn't a perfect marriage between uh, Detroit and Griffin, but something of that same type of move where the Pistons are using what they have to go and make an upgrade via the trade market, get a legitimate piece to put alongside Kate Cunningham that that you can see those two guys really being your two core pieces moving forward. I think that. Uh, it's an opportunity this offseason that Detroit will have. I think there's pressure. Maybe even if Detroit isn't able to make that type of significant move, they still need to be playing the market for uh, maybe a move that's a little bit of a tier below that, whether it's a guy like Aiton. Um, I don't really view Sexton or Brunson as that same tier. I think they're a lower tier. Um, but Detroit needs to be very, very active. And, and if even if it is just using the fifth pick and, and still moving Jeremy Grant, like they need to do something to, to really get an influx of talent uh, into this roster because there's only so much improvement that a team that won 23 wins or won 23 games last season is going to have without making a lot of significant moves. And, you know, the other thing is we know Troy Weaver isn't okay sitting still with the same roster. This is a guy that's overhauled this roster time and time again, bringing in different players. So I don't think we'll necessarily necessarily see him sit back and, and watch this soft season play out. I think we're going to see the Pistons at the forefront uh, of some of these transactions and, and absolutely trying to make a splash, which is exactly what they should be doing at this point in their timeline. So <clears throat> there were a lot of names there. Um, Donovan Mitchell, uh, many teams have already called the Jazz about – trying to acquire Donovan Mitchell um, due to the circumstances you had mentioned, Utah sort of just hitting a wall. Um, I don't necessarily think that they're going to trade him. Uh, they're, I, I feel like they're exceedingly more likely to trade Rudy Gobert and try to get a piece to build um, with Mitchell. But the Pistons should definitely be one of those teams calling. What are you offering for Donovan Mitchell? All things considered uh you know the contract age um you, you know what what would you be willing to give up for donovan mitchell i mean certainly five and and what else uh you're talking about a 25 year old that has four years left on his contract he's a star 35 million dollars left on his contract exactly he's a star you're throwing the kitchen sink out there for donovan mitchell you're willing to give up jeremy grant you're willing to give up the fifth pick you're willing to give up sneak bay Whatever it takes to get a player of that caliber, uh, you have to be willing to put out there. And I'm not saying Detroit has to put all their eggs in one basket and give up everything for Donovan Mitchell, but it is going to take, take a significant haul to bring back a guy of Mitchell's stature, a multiple-time NBA All-Star at 25 years old. He's under control for another four seasons after or going into next year. So you're getting, you know, in theory, four years of an All-Star top 15, 20-ish NBA player, depending on where you rank him, you have to be willing to, to throw whatever out there. And, you know, I, I think I think if you're Detroit, it's Jeremy Grant, Sadiq Bay, the fifth pick, all that has to be on, on the table uh, if you have a chance to get a guy like Donovan Mitchell because he is a foreseeable piece that you could put alongside Cade Cunningham and they have a very dynamic – one-two punch between those two players. Both of them can handle the basketball. You know, both of them can can be big-time players in clutch situations. Mitchell obviously brings that that elite athleticism at the guard spot. He would bring explosiveness, transition offense to this team. And Kate Cunningham would get some of the pressure taken off of him, but he'd still be allowed to do his things, and teams wouldn't be able to so solely focus on either of them because the other one is just as dangerous. So the Pistons have to be willing to throw anything and anything, everything and anything out there uh, for Donovan Mitchell. He is a legitimate all-star level player and people will nitpick uh, him, you know, on the defensive end or, or whatever it may be, but there's no denying what he brings to the table and he has proven it in his playoff performances. Uh, and then even in his regular season campaigns, I mean, what he has done and, you know, his four or five years in the league is, is absolutely remarkable. So uh, the Pistons can't, 
be overvaluing their their assets of these guys that aren't all-star level players like if it takes bay if it takes grant and it takes the fifth pick you're talking about a franchise player you make that trade 10 times out of 10 and you figure out how to get these other role player type guys at a later point in time so out of the names that we sort of talked about between Mitchell, Levine, Aiton, Brunson, and Sexton, if you had to, you know, if you had to rank them just real briefly in terms of, you know, feasibly getting and considering the cost it would take to get them. Um, I don't really know if the Pistons are in on Donovan Mitchell. I, I don't know if they're willing to uh, sell everything in the kitchen sink to get him. I don't necessarily think that they should. Um, because I, I don't know if what we just outlined between five and Grant and Sadiq Bay is enough. I think other teams will, you know, will pony up. And if they still want to compete, I don't necessarily think the, you know, the fifth pick overall is going to, um, it's going to entice them. So, and it's still very early. The Jazz have not knocked down any potential trades, for, you know, involving Donovan Mitchell. But, you know, if you were to sort of just, talk about some of those players. I mean, obviously Mitchell would be the biggest splash. Um, We've talked about Aiton, Brunson, and Sexton quite a bit. What about Zach Levine? He doesn't really fit the window of opportunity that um, Donovan Mitchell or DeAndre Aiton sort of represent. He's probably looking to win a championship. I mean, I think Lakers, Blazers type, you know, maybe maybe Sacramento Kings um, type of, of teams would would you push hard if you're the Pistons to go get a guy like Zach Levine I mean you have the cap space or you could get the cap space most definitely I mean Levine's only a couple of years older than than Donovan Mitchell he just turned 27 he'll be 27 throughout all of next season um he's only a couple of years older and his production is 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 that that same tier I mean this is a 25 point five rebound five assist game type guy shoots around over 38 percent from the three-point line brings elite athleticism brings some secondary playmaking uh, and he would fit very very well next to Kate Cunningham that's the type of guy where he's not necessarily good enough to be uh the the number one piece on a on a title team or on a on a playoff team but if, if you can get him to the point where him and Kate Cunningham are kind of that one A one B type duo. I think there's some legitimate legitimacy beyond that behind that being a, a very good foundation for for the Pistons. And I'm not sure if getting Zach Levine is all that realistic. I'm not sure if it's something where it ends up being a sign and t- trade type of situation where they end up having to give up assets to get Levine uh, on top of giving up their cap space. But Detroit should absolutely be open to it. Uh, he is a guy that can score 40 in the blink of an eye. I, I think the Pistons are again in a situation where getting talent should be the number one priority. Uh, even if it costs some of your young core pieces that you are excited about, honestly, that doesn't really matter when you're talking about guys who are all star level players who are still relatively young. You know, Zach Levine at 27. Is, is still at three, four, five years of high-level basketball uh, in the tank. So I, I think the Pistons should absolutely try to be a player for Levine. I think if you're ranking guys that they should go after, obviously Mitchell and Levine stand atop that list. DeAndre Ayton is certainly a more realistic option uh, that feels a lot more attainable. I would probably slot him third on that list. And and then some of these other guys that have been mentioned that, like I mentioned earlier, I think are a little bit of a tier below some of uh, these previous names, Colin Sexton, Jalen Brunson, uh, even Mitchell Robinson, you know, those guys are fine, but I don't think any of them really elevate the ceiling of, of this Pistons team. So I think Detroit needs to be going after higher tier talent. And you know what, if they swing and miss, then they swing and miss, but you have to try it. Uh, especially when they can be acquired via trade because it's a lot more difficult, as we know, with the Pistons uh, acquiring them via free agency. Now, maybe the uh, arrival and, uh, you know, a resurgence of Cade Cunningham changes that. Maybe 
you know, what he's done. He's, he's garnered certainly a, a lot of respect from NBA veterans across the league uh, throughout his rookie season. Maybe that kind of changes things, but uh, until we actually see that in action, the Pistons have to be prepared to acquire te- top tier talent via trade and Levine and Aiton and Mitchell are all guys that whether it's signing trades or training for trading for them outright are guys that are going to present that type of situation for Detroit. They have to be ready to make those type of moves. So DeAndre Ayton was kind of a, that's the name that the Pistons have been, have been most closely linked to just because of how things ended in Phoenix. And he only played a handful of minutes in their game seven loss to Dallas. The Pistons desperately need a center. Um, that That's really, you know, to me, what they need to be focusing on. I mean, whether they get Mitchell Robinson or Mel Bamba or, or whoever, or they trade back and get, you know, Jalen Duran or Mark Williams or something, they need a center. But um, DeAndre Ayton was the name that uh, Bet Online said, uh, you know, the Pistons are, are near the top or at the top in terms of odds to land DeAndre Ayton. And, you know, there is some overlap there for a sign and trade. The Suns are looking to compete right now. They could get Jeremy Grant out of it. They can get some other know role players that the Pistons have to you know to keep their championship window propped open but in in the in the round table for Palace of Pistons which we haven't checked that out go to palaceofpistons.com we recently ran a little round table with some of the writers discussing draft um, desires uh, predictions and then what to do with Jeremy Graham and one of the questions that was posed was about DeAndre Ayton and if you'd give DeAndre Ayton the max um, in any sign and trade, or if you'd rather keep your cap space available, sign a lesser guy like a, like a Mitchell Robinson or a Mo Bamba or, you know, somebody else. Um, do you have any reservations about, because I was expecting everybody to say, oh yeah, give him the max. He's young. He fits what they need. He's, a, you know, has, sh- has shown some, some growth over the years you know, in Phoenix. There was some hesitation uh, all of a sudden when, from some of our respondees about giving Aiton the max, whether that's due to his motor, um, you know, or if, uh, if, if he's enough of a ceiling raiser to give him max money, do you have any trepidation about giving DeAndre Aiton max dollars? Because he's going to get max dollars and the Suns are not going to let him walk for nothing. They're going to do a sign and trade. It just seems 99.9% chance. Phoenix isn't just going to let him walk for nothing, especially since they are trying to compete for a championship. Well, the way I see it is if he's going to get max money and it's already been reported um, that he's going to get max money and there are numerous teams that are willing to give him max money, you, if you're Detroit, you have to pony up and pay that if you're serious about getting him because you're talking about a guy that's going to be 24 next season, 17 points, 10 rebounds a game. The guy shot 64% from inside the arc. I mean, he is hyper, hyper efficient. I believe he has a three-point shot. We started seeing it a very little bit towards the end of the season and a very, very little bit in the playoffs. But I think that's a, a, a natural development in his game as he continues to work on it and, and, and gets a, a bit of a bigger leash, maybe in a situation uh, in Detroit where he's asked to do a little bit more. But you're talking about a guy that produced big time played a key role as the anchor of uh, a top team's defense. He has legitimate NBA playoff experience. I get that it's tough to to conceivably pay a center that much money that's not a a Joel Embiid or or Nikola Jokic, and Aiden's not in that same tier. But he would significantly raise uh, the, the ceiling of this team, and he fits the mold of the type of guys that you want playing alongside Kate Cunningham. I think you looked at the, if you looked at the impact that Marvin Bagley made uh, with the Pistons once he got traded, having that big that that could jump, run pick and rolls with Cade Cunningham, finish alley oops, make plays inside. Like DeAndre Ayton is ten times the player Marvin Bagley is, and, and does a lot of those same things and more. So you're talking about a guy that would seem seeming seamlessly, excuse me, fit with this team, and we know Cade Cunningham can play with just about any archetype of player. Aiden is the perfect archetype to play uh, with Kate Cunningham because of his ability to play in pick and roll. I mean, he played with perhaps the greatest pick and roll point guard of all time, one of the greatest passing point guards of all time in Chris Paul. So he has familiarity playing in those types of offenses. 
picking his spots. He can hit the 16, 18 footer. I think he's a legitimate prospect to become a three point shooter. He can be the, the organizer of a defense. And if everybody else is willing to pay him kind of feels like you should be willing to pay him another way. It's just another one of those stories. Another one of those examples of you've probably got to trade for him to acquire him. You're not going to probably be able to sign him, you know, outright in free agency. Obviously he's restricted anyway. So Phoenix can match it. And I'm sure they will, as you said, so they can get something of return and a sign and trade. I would pay max money to Deandre and the Pistons have a ton of cap space. They don't have anyone that they need to commit it to right now. Uh, Cunningham's under contract Bay's under contract you have, and you can pay it over the tax to get those guys. If it ends up being that way and you end up building a team that, it's good enough to pay over the tax for. Um, so uh, you have to be all in on getting top tier talent, getting the, that high level talent. Aiton is one of those guys. He's one of those best players available this summer. And I think the Pistons should be all in on trying to get him. He would definitely raise the ceiling of this team, um, but he would not solve all of the issues. Uh, there's, there's what some national writers call a small market tax. And that's sort of, you know, what the, Pistons would have to pay. They'd be paying a small market tax um, to, you know, to acquire pretty much any free agent, but, you know, you're going to have to pony up for DeAndre Ayton if you want him. I, I just found it very interesting that there was some, some fears from some of our writers um, about paying him uh, the max. I thought it was very interesting and how things have flipped. I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think you should probably just pay him. You have cap space. Um, you need a center. Uh, you're looking to build and, and pair uh, high-end players with Kate Cunningham. And like you said, he can fit with just about anybody. He, he has that effect and that gravity. Um, so I, I'm in the same boat. I think I would pay him. I definitely would rather pay him over Jalen Brunson or Colin Sexton, you know, when push comes to shove. Um, so in terms of splashes, since this was the topic, um, you're all in on making a splash. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm still a little bit hesitant because I, I don't want the Pistons to just throw out picks and trade to Jeremy Grant and make moves for the sake of making moves. And, you know, I, I think they do have to maintain some, some tactical thinking. Oh, I um, agree. They don't have to trade Grant either. I agree with that 100%. If it's not, you know, a legitimate – all-star level player they don't need to go out and, and do something like that but if you have a chance to get an all-star level player like everything has to be on the table just when you look at where the pistons are at where they need to get with a guy like kate cunningham like the clock is is already ticking that's just how it works in today's nba they don't need to be reckless but if they can legit get a legitimate piece they need to be aggressive in doing so and they don't have to trade jeremy grant either I mean, you, you've been a major uh, proponent of that. You know, you, you don't have to you don't have to trade him. You could use your cap space and, and sign him. Um, he is extension eligible, uh, you know, and plan for the future by pairing him with Kate Cunningham and then, you know, the fifth pick overall. But um, it seems like seems like they're going to move him. Um, it's it's just a matter of when and where, uh, and then you know what what can you feasibly get back. So, okay. Good talk uh, about making a splash, some, some primers and ideas out there. Uh, we will, we'll be looking forward to this because, you know, I, I kind of, kind of agree with you that, you know, they, they should and could be exploring a tra trade. And I think the, I think the NBA is just kind of oddly eerily quiet right now. And, and Utah uh, not having Quinn Snyder going in a different direction, you know, they're at a, they're at a crossroads. I think that's very interesting. And, and we're all kind of just waiting for the next thing to fall. Like as soon as the finals end, I, I feel like we're going to start to hear things that are going to quietly bubble up to the surface. Um, so that's very exciting. So, okay, good stuff. Uh, before we move on to our second topic, uh, which is smoke screens regarding the draft and how we've had some conflicting information for who the Pistons may be looking to draft for the fifth overall pick. Before we get over to that, uh, we do have. Uh, an ad read from one of our sponsors. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. 
topic number two, our final topic on this shorter podcast. Uh, we're going to talk about smoke screens. And, you know, the Pistons have been linked to a number of prospects. That's what happens when you fall out of the top three of a draft that's regarded as top three heavy and then kind of wonky after that. Um, so there's been a lot of conflicting information. At fifth overall, there's a number of players that they've been linked to. They've, they've been in touch and, you know, would like to um, – Take a closer look at guys like Jane Ivey, um, Keegan Murray, Ben Matherin. There's a number of guys. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are more, uh, at, you know, that they are looking at, at that fifth spot. And, you know, if they are going to trade Grant, then they have to be prepared to be looking at the late lottery, you know, as, as well. But we've had some conflicting reports there, and we all know where these are coming from. You can, you can just guess one, and there's a chance that they were included in these rumors, whether that be the ringer, whether that be the athletic or ESPN or whatever, there were some reports that the Pistons were kind of iffy on Jaden Ivey, hot and cold. Um, another, you know, a few days later, uh, there was a report that the Pistons really like Jaden Ivey. Um, there's other reports that the Pistons are more interested in Keegan Murray and Ben Matherin. Um, there's just a lot of iffiness and, you know, David Aldridge of the athletic put out a really good piece that highlighted mock drafts. And I think it's worth talking about because um, mock drafts, much like the NFL uh, mock drafts generate a ton of clicks, um, a ton of clicks. People want to see what people think about who's going to get picked and how that's going to impact free agency and how it's going to impact the next picks after that. So there's definitely something to be said about, mock drafts and these weird smoke screens that we get teams are not going to just divulge all this information uh, about players and who's going to be drafted where and who likes who a lot and who's going in for a second workout or things like that teams are being strategic in what information they release to reporters and the media because they are playing the long game of um, from now to the draft how is what information I give out? How is that going to impact another team and their potential viewpoint? I mean, you know, if if the Kings are all in on Jaden Ivy, is that going to change the Pistons calculus? Are they going to want to move up to four to get Ivy because they love him so much? Or, you know, are, are they going to just sit back and wait? Or is Sacramento going to trade out four? You know, there's lots of news that changes day to day. So as a consumer of basketball content, as we both are, how do you navigate um, and as a Browns fan and a U.S. Lions fan, having to go through very high NFL draft picks constantly, there's a ton. You know, there is mock draft season for our two cities. Uh, there, there is just this aura around the draft season. Um, you know, how do you navigate so much conflicting, in, you know, information leading up to the draft? Well, I think first off, you know, you have to look at where you're getting your information from. And like obviously, there are specific people, there are specific outlets that you know the information that they're getting is vetted and it's it's fair. Like, you know you're not getting fake information. You're not getting something that's spun from just a certain point of view or, or brought up out of thin air. Like, for Detroit, obviously, you have The Athletic. You have James Edwards the third. You have the Detroit Free Press, the Detroit News. Like, if these beat reporters are saying something or if it's Adrian Wojnarowski – Shams, like these people obviously know what they're talking about. But at the same time, you have to take everything, especially when it comes to the NBA draft or, you know, another professional league's draft. You have to take everything that is said with a grain of salt because, for example, the Pistons, they probably like Jaden Ivey, but maybe he's not the first name on their big board. Like maybe they do have Keegan Murray ahead of Jaden Ivey on their big board. So that could get spun a couple different ways. That could get spun as, you know, the Pistons are hot and cold on Ivy, or it could be spun as the Pistons don't like Ivy, or it could just be spun as the Pistons really like Keegan Murray and they have him ranked highly on their big board. You have to vet the information from where you're getting it from, but you have to take everything with a grain of salt because obviously there's going to be organizations, there's going to be people within organizations that leak information with an agenda. There's going to be, a front office personnel or a scouting personnel that says something hoping it leaks to another franchise, another front office that makes them react a certain way. And that's what you see. 
every draft season. I think we're seeing it with, with the Pistons right now. And then we saw last year, even with had the Evan Mobley and Jalen Green stuff, like everybody tried to create this notion that the Pistons weren't necessarily locked in on Kate Cunningham, Evan Mobley and Jalen Green were legitimate options. And I think if you, you really understood the situation the whole time through, you knew it was going to be Kate Cunningham who the Pistons picked first. This year, you're in a situation where part of it is the fan base, at least from what I think you and I have seen and others have seen, is it's relatively divided. There are some people that swear by Jaden Ivey. There are some people that swear Keegan Murray is, is the pick for Detroit. Or there are some people that might say it's Jaden Sharp or Benedict Matherin. So some people are taking what they hear and mixing it with their opinion, and then they're creating an even more clouded report clouded point of view clouded source you cannot do that with this information you have to take what is said and say look this reporter is saying the pistons are interested in keegan murray and benedict mathrin and let's face it the pistons probably are the pistons are probably looking at 10 to 15 different prospects for the fifth pick alone does that mean that there's a, a, a the same chance same percentage chance that they take Jeremy Sokan or uh, Jalen Duran compared to uh, Jason Dyson Daniels, Murray, Dyson Daniels, like all these guys, you know, just because they're on Detroit's big board or just because they're interested in all those guys doesn't mean they're going to take them or have the same percentage of interest in these guys, but they're doing their job. And even if they like Dyson Daniels, doesn't mean they're going to take them with the fifth pick. They could like Dyson Daniels. And that could be a reason why they trade back into the top 10, whether that be trading Jeremy Grant or something else so that they can get him at seven or eight or nine or something along those lines. Right. So you have to look at where you're getting the information from. You have to understand that specifically in a draft season, every front office, every scouting department is trying to get a leg up, is trying to understand what other teams are thinking. So they're going to say things to see what other teams say, to see if they react in a certain way. If so-and-so, if so-and-so team says, Hey, we really like Jade and Ivy and we would consider trading up to take him. And that's reported as, you know, executive in, you know, the Sacramento Kings are interested in trading back uh, because, you know, they don't necessarily love anyone at four. Maybe that connects the dots where those two teams are trying to end up having a conversation about trading that pick. It's just that type of stuff that you have to be aware of. Like if a legit, if a legitimate reporter is saying something, odds are it's true, but it's true in a certain sense. It's true from a certain point of view. Uh, So taking everything with a grain of salt, understanding that just because it's reported so-and-so team like so-and-so player does not mean that they're going to pick that player. A lot of teams, like a lot of different players, doesn't mean they're going to end up on the roster. We've seen that a lot with the Pistons, um, just from what's been reported these past few weeks since, since the draft lottery. We know they like Murray. We've heard about Murray from really throughout the season that they've liked Murray. And I mean, what's there not to like about him? He is the epitome of production. Uh, at the college level, playing in a, in a legitimate conference in the Big Ten. We know they like Benedict Matherin. How do you not like Benedict Matherin? He's an explosive player with legitimate upside on both sides of the floor, super athletic, can shoot from outside. And Jaden Ivey, like we know that they like Ivey. Maybe some people like him more than others inside the Pistons front office. But that's something that you have to, to take, it, it, take into consideration as well. You're getting the point of view from one person or or two people inside a front office. There are probably 10 to 15 other people that also have an opinion on that player inside the front office, inside the scouting department that have a legitimate voice in the decision that is made on draft night. So there's a lot of factors that that come into play with all this stuff. And there's so much smoke screen out there. You should honestly expect that your team likes every player and would be willing to take any player because that's really what it is at this point. And especially when you're a team like Detroit, who's already been rumored to potentially be getting another top 10 pick uh, if they trade Jeremy Grant. Like we've obviously heard so much about Portland and seven potentially being the spot for Jeremy Grant. You have to be, um, you know, scouting more than one or two players. You have to be of of, of knowledge of these different players because you could end up with Jaden Ivey at five and there's still a chance you could get Keegan Murray at seven and, and, you know, are a different combination of players. So, so much is going to be said. And a lot of it is true, but there's also 
um, narratives. There's also, you know, reasons why these things get leaked. You know, so and so from the the Detroit Pistons is not going out of his way to to call up a certain reporter and say, "Hey, we're interested in Jaden Ivy," just to leak, "Hey, that the Pistons like Jaden Ivy." Like there is a reason behind that. Um, so that's that's kind of my spiel on all that. You have to really understand there's a lot going on every time you hear a report uh, when it comes to the draft or, or free agency or the NBA trade deadline. There's so much that goes into that. It's not just a buddy from uh, inside the team calling up his buddy from outside the team saying, hey, yeah, we like this guy. You should go tell everyone. Like, there's m- a lot more to it. There's an end yeah. one, uh, which with, with each leak and with each conversation about these types of things. Right. And there there are stories where it's purely a click that's that's a site that is looking to get a click they're looking you know to get that viewership and that's it and um you know it just goes back to the the point that you made earlier which is you have to vet where you're getting your information from but i think david aldridge's point about mock drafts is really interesting and i think the general nba fan which we're not, I, I mean, we're not in that category. We're, we're, we're talking about the person that dips in, in and out throughout the season. Um, you know, the general person can look at mock drafts. And do you think, because it really begs the question, how impactful are mock drafts other than, you know, do they provide actual tangible information that's, you know, that's beneficial uh, or, are they just clickbait? Because the more and more I think about it and the more and more I've you know, self-examined my habits when it gets to the draft time of looking at mock drafts, whether that be for any sport, it really doesn't provide a lot of information. I'm looking for something to you know, just generally read and I don't necessarily gather a whole lot out of it, nor are they usually accurate. So what is your perception of mock drafts, I guess? Because I've kind of self-evaluated the last couple of days here since I read that and thought, I don't really think, you know, it's actually not that impactful or helpful to read a mock draft. It's much easier to do your own research on an individual player um, or read a player profile and then make a justification based on that. Sure. Oh, it's most, it's definitely more beneficial to do your own research and formulate your own opinions, but you know, not everyone is looking up a mock draft for the same exact reason. Right. And if I make a mock draft, I might know something about the Pistons, you know, thought process in the draft, but I'm not going to know everything that each one of these teams is thinking. There are some people that are connected enough that are able to talk to a contact within each organization or within most organizations that are able to put together a mock draft that is, you know, somewhat accurate. And also provides a, an insight into a team's thinking and provides insight into all of these players. Like I don't watch every single one of these prospects, uh, you know, in their college career or in their international career. I watch some of them because I watch, you know, the big 10 tournament. I watch big 10, I watch the big 10 tournament. I watch the NCAA tournament. I'll watch, you know, some of the big matchups just throughout the year, but I don't watch, you know, I don't watch Gonzaga play 10, 15 times a year. I don't watch any teams really play 10, 15 times a year. So I can't give a great analysis of a player like some of these other people can. And and when you mix in people that watch and write and report about college basketball for a living, when you talk about them and you compare them to Joe Schmo, like me, who may know one thing from having one connection within one organization, like the other person's mock draft is going to be much more valuable than just the Joe Schmo. Like if you're talking about, Sam Vicini or Vicini, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say his last name from the athletic. Like he's going to have a very legitimate mock draft because he has Intel. He watches scouts reports on college basketball 24 seven. That's his job. So I think there's value in his mock draft because you're going to get information on a team's point of view on a team's thinking and a fair analysis of a prospect. But if you're looking at me, who doesn't watch all these players, not at a high enough clip and isn't connected with every team. My mock draft is essentially worthless. So it's an entertainment value as well. Like people read them to be entertained, to see 
if the player they want, like, let's face it, odds are half of the people that read a mock draft are just hoping to find a mock draft that shows that the player they think that the team they like. That's exactly right. Is matched up with this person's mock draft. So they can say, oh, I like this mock draft. It has so-and-so going to the Pistons. Like, if you want Jaden Ivey to be a Piston and Joe Schmo's mock draft has Jaden Ivey to the Pistons at five, you're probably going to like that mock draft. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was just very interesting because in reading that piece from David Aldridge, you know, it did force me to think back and be like, how much did I actually get out of mock drafts? And how, how much of me reading mocks was just being bored uh, in class, <laughs> you know, and, and wanting to read something entertaining? It, there's definitely an entertainment piece to it. Be like, oh, my gosh, they had Shaden Sharp going to the Oklahoma City Thunder. How bizarre is that? Look at this crazy mock draft. And. You know, there is just a component of ooh and ah that that people are hoping to get out of out of their piece. So, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to I think I'm going to you know swear off of mock drafts for a while and and, you know, take in information in, in different ways because I you can't gain a whole lot from them. I mean, people use mock drafts in betting to see like how accurate they were. Um, and that's that stuff just, you know. I don't want to say it's like too surface level because there are mocks that are definitely not surface level, but they're, they're, it's just more of an entertainment piece than actual um, actual NBA content, and that's not for everybody. I don't I don't want to I don't want to generalize it. There are definitely some mocks that are really in depth, um, but uh, you know I think in general it's just easy to put out mock draft and. It just kind of gets gets eyeballs on it. So, you know, just to wrap up this topic here and this podcast, how much of a you know smoke screen do you think there is right now? I mean, the top three seems pretty much set in stone. It's really four onward that there's this weird um, just feeling of you know the Kings might trade out, Portland might trade out, you know Washington could trade out you know the pelicans could trade out because they had the lakers pick so you know how much of a smoke screen do you think is out there right now and you know should should fans be taking things with a grain of salt absolutely they should because who really knows what sacramento wants to do with four who really knows sacramento doesn't know what they want to do with four exactly And, and 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 what about this report that oklahoma city wants to trade their pick like is that true or are they posturing like are they seeing if someone's really going to send them this holy grail offer for their pick? So I think there's a ton of smoke screen out there. And while, you know, we might know that in some combination, you know, Chet, Paolo, and Chet, or excuse me, Jabari are going to go in the top three, like who's going to go one? Like, I think that's pretty open. Like I would take Paolo if I was picking number one, but I think most mock drafts currently have Jabari. And then if Jabari goes one, who goes two? Like, I think a lot would say Chet. And, you know, there's still two weeks left until the draft. So much can change. This We're going to see, at some point, there's going to be some talk that a Jaden Ivey or a Shane and Sharp could jump into the top three. That's going to be smokescreen as well. It just always happens. We see it every summer. Heck, even last year, it was it was Scotty Barnes who actually did jump into the top four. Like we thought the top of the draft was set. It was going to be Cade Mobley, you know, in, in some order out after Cade Mobley green and, and Jalen Suggs, all of a sudden Scotty Barnes jumped in at four. So there's always that turned out to be a pretty good pick. <laughs> it, it actually, it worked out, but there's always something. There's always some story that jumps up late. And there's always trades that happen, obviously, on draft night. So there's there's so much going on right now that hasn't been leaked, that hasn't been reported, because that's actually probably the more realistic in, in, uh, stuff going on behind the scenes. The more outlandish stuff is the stuff that ends up getting leaked. Um, so I think there's still, still definitely a ton of smoke screen out there. We're going to see some more stuff leak, obviously. Um, you'll get that late push that so-and-so is going to jump up the draft board because we get that every year with one or two prospects, or maybe it'll be so-and-so's falling down, sliding in, in mocks or, you know, in, in teams draft boards. So, you know, I think this is uh, obviously a fun time for the league, but I think, you know, just the casual follower or, you know, the casual NBA Twitter person, you know, obviously they need to be aware that 
everything that gets reported, there's a narrative behind that being leaked out to you. It's not, it's not leaked out just because we're like, Hey, let's, let's tell some people what we're thinking uh, and let's give them an insight right. of what we're thinking. Like they're not doing it for you. They're doing it with a backhanded intention. There is intent behind it. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. One last question because we, we didn't talk too, too much about the draft. Um, so let's just say that the Pistons are picking five and Jay Nighy's gone. Who is, who is your pick at five? I think I like Benedict Matherin. He was a guy I'm that the I, same boat. Yeah. I mean, I think I like Pete Keegan Murray too. Like it would not be a bad pick for Detroit. Uh, but you know, I, I, I've talked about how much I like Jeremy Grant as well. And I think he has a future on this team. If the Pistons want him to, you know, you can keep Jeremy Grant and draft Benedict Matherin. And you have a guy that's a legitimate two-way player that fits very well alongside Kate Cunningham. He may not be the, the creator that Jade and Ivy is, but he is a, a consistent three-point threat. He brings a very high level uh, of athleticism. He brings defensive versatility. He has good length. There's a lot to like about Matherin, and I, I, I would be okay with Detroit selecting him at five. I guess even if Ivy was still on the board, I don't think that happens. I don't think Ivy gets past five. I doubt he gets past four, really. Um, but Benedict Matherin is is a guy that I really like. I think if you look at Matherin, you look at Ivy, you look at Murray, if the Pistons end up with one of those three guys, they're going to get a, a positive impact player right away and – you should be happy with that. I, I think Ivy's definitely still my top target. I think he has the highest ceiling out of those guys. Um, but ending up with Matherin or Murray would, would still be okay. I think if I had to pick between uh, Murray and Matherin right now, I, I'd lean towards Matherin. Um, but I think Detroit has some some good options at five. And this that kind of grouping has grown on me throughout the, this process. Yeah, I, I was pretty out on Keegan Murray at the beginning, the very beginning, after finding out that the Pistons were going to be at five and it was a legitimate possibility that they get him, I'm not nearly as out on him. I think his floor, his immediate floor is, is pretty solid. And, you know, you said it earlier, he is the epitome of production and if we immediately come in and make an impact. He's a go-to-work kind of guy, which Troy Weaver likes um, and, you know, would probably resonate with the fans too. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I like Ben Matherin, as Jasper has said previously in our group chat, and as mentioned in the round table, he has that dog in him. And, um, you know, a consistent three-point threat makes makes a lot of sense for the Pistons. They need shooting in, you know, the worst way. They're one of the league's worst shooting teams overall. Uh, so I, I, I do like Ben Matherin. I would be fine with him or Keegan Murray as well. And, and I'm on board with Jay Nivey w- would be top of the list of those three. Um, so I agree. I don't think he makes it past four unless the Kings trade out of four and then all call, you know, all chaos ensues. And, and this goes back to our smoke screen and mock draft, you know, discussion of, you know, teams can't really plan for any of these moves. So what's, what's the point in even trying to predict? So yeah, we're on the same page. Uh, we'll have definitely more draft talk. Uh, as we get ever closer to the NBA draft on June 23rd, right? It's, it's the 23rd. Yeah. 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 Here's it's going to be here 23rd. sooner than we think. So we have one more podcast before it's looking like one more podcast right. before the draft. And then right. we'll either have to record that, that Thursday night after that first pick or Friday. And we'll, we'll go from there. Um, yep, rapid reaction podcast. We get to use those those big bolded, yeah. all caps words to you know maximize our viewership. Rapid reaction. The, <laughs> the off season really really gets going once the draft hits because it's you get that you you get summer league, which is just such a joy for me. I love 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 summer league. I love seeing dudes compete for roster spots and getting a little preview into the top picks. And then you go right yep. into the free agency too. Um, and, and the trade market obviously will be, will start booming, uh, you know, right around the draft. We'll, we'll definitely see some, some draft night trades. So it starts yep. June 23rd. You'll, you'll definitely see some stuff 
uh, in the offseason will really get going. And that's what the NBA Finals, you know, wrapping up, what, you know, a week before the, the draft. So there's yeah. really at a point where the offseason, the NBA really isn't the offseason anymore. There's always something going on outside of like a few weeks in mid-August to, you know, September. Right. Yep. And we are going to be covering all of it. And like Aaron said, we will have another podcast before the draft and we'll have a probably a rapid reaction pod after the draft happens. Uh, we might even record that during and then just post it as soon as the draft ends or something like that. Um, but we hope that you will stick with us along the way. We have some content on palacebusiness.com. Again, that round table is posted. Uh, so we would really appreciate it if you would check that out. We will have player previews coming as well for draft picks. I, I, I believe we have dubbed them scouting reports, really just uh, a genius original name. <laughs> scouting reports for most of the players that are going to be around when the Pistons are probably picking at five. Um, and then a few other players, if, you know, if they do trade back into the lottery, we want to evaluate those guys as well. So stay in tune to palacepistons.com. We will have plenty of written content coming down the pipe. Uh, so we hope that you'll uh, be around to see that. Um, Aaron, that, that's, that's the end of this podcast. Do you have any other final thoughts before I wrap us up? No, I mean, it's, it's about to get fun. So, you know, excited to continue to bring you this content on the podcast. I'm going to check out on palacepistons.com. I mean, I guess I, I said it last week. I'll say it again. Your guys' support of the podcast recently has been just absolutely awesome. So, you know, we appreciate everyone tuning in. And, you know, wherever you're, you're listening, leave us a review. Leave us a like. Uh, if you're, you know, watching on YouTube, definitely hit that subscribe button. We certainly appreciate it. Um, but, yeah, your support's been awesome. And we're excited to continue to, to bring content. Hopefully, you know, we can make it better and better for you. That's a great way to end it. And I will co-sign on that. Thank you for all the support for this podcast. It, uh, you know, can't, could not have imagined that we'd be having, you know, as many listeners as we do, um, you know, especially when I was recording it on my apartment floor <laughs> uh, and recording it at, or uh, editing it rather at two o'clock in the morning. It's, uh, it's been really fun to be a part of the process and we're really glad that you're all part of it as well. Uh, so this is going to do it for, this latest edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast, part of the Believe Network. We hope that you'll be joining us next week again as we get set for the NBA draft. And once again, thank you to our sponsors, Bet Online and Credit Karma. Uh, and we also hope you'll be joining us on palacepistons.com to check out all of our written content as well. So for Aaron Johnson, I am Mike Angolano. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. We will see you all next time.